Hi there, welcome to week eight of Mod Po on the Language Poets. Weeks eight, nine, and 10 are meant to go together. Uh, they're all, they all form chapter nine, so-called. 9.1 is week eight, 9.2 is week nine, and 9.3 is week 10. In week eight, chapter 9.1, we talk about the language poets, as I've mentioned. I'm gonna talk about that for a few minutes here by way of introduction to the week. In week nine, we look at chance-based and or aleatory poetry. Um, and you'll find that weeks eight, nine, and 10 relate to each other. Uh, they're all about roughly contemporary poetry um, and they're all happening kind of simultaneously. Week 10 happening a little later chronologically, but the, the three kind of go together as a way of, of providing an introduction to certain kinds of contemporary experimental poetry. So week eight, as I say, language poetry, week nine, chance-based or aleatory poetry, and week 10, uh, conceptual poetry, both narrowly and um, uh, widely defined, conceptual poetry and other recent and contemporary poetry of reuse, quotation, redeployment, un in unoriginality, sound repetition, Detourment, the poetry of determinant, um, that's week 10. All right, so there are two ways to think about language poetry. One, in a literary historical and theoretical sense, it refers to several clusters of poets of a certain generation, not specifically, but we would say a 60s and post 60s generation, people who came of age in the 60s, 50s and 60s, who were pretty much typically radicalized by the experience of the 60s and developed the kind of poetry we're talking about in the 70s and 80s and of course continue to work uh, through the 90s and beyond. A certain generation in certain poetry communities, particularly San Francisco and New York, but also DC, Washington DC, then Buffalo, uh, later in the late 80s and 90s, and then late, much later Philadelphia, that's one narrow way and maybe ultimately less interesting way of talking about the language poets. I shouldn't say less interesting, but it is a more literary historical sense. A wider and perhaps more um, productive way to think about the language poets is to think about those who, including the first generation self-identified language poets and others later and now, who have been influenced by the ideas and theories or theoretical um, approach, the whole interest in theory. Um, poets interested in theory, that's a long tradition in US and other avant-garde in the poetic world, but now the language poets took it very seriously. They, were, they said thumbs down to the fuzzy-headed poet who was not really a reader of criticism and theory and aesthetic theory in particular, but who just wrote the poems from the heart and stood out in a field and felt the romantic urge to express. Um, the language poets generally mocked that kind of uh, n natural, natural poet, um, which is why it puts them at least superficially at odds with some of the ideas, for instance, of the beat poets and some of the ideas of the so-called improvisational poets. But anyway, I get ahead of myself. So two ways of thinking about language poetry. One, those clusters of uh, colleagues, friends for the most part of a certain generation in certain poetry communities. And second, those who later and now have been influenced by the theories and ideas of the first self-identified language poets. And I, I'll ask you to look for a, a, another short, very short, much too short video in which I try to summarize some of the ideas and theories of the first self-identified language poets. So this week we meet Lynn Higinian, a few excerpts from My Life, her um, non-chronological, non-narrative, disjunctive, paratactic autobiography, My Life. Then Bob Perlman, Chronic Meanings, Charles Bernstein in a restless world like this is. Then Susan Howe in uh, excerpts from her book, My Emily Dickinson. Uh, 
And I would say in the narrowest sense or in the most obvious sense, those four represent in the main syllabus the first generation um, and uh, or the, the sort of specifically self-identified language poets. And in a moment, I'll tell you about Mod Po Plus where we're gonna meet some other, some other terrific poets who could easily be in the, in the main syllabus, but aren't for lack of room. And then Harriet Mullen, uh, a piece, uh, two, two poems from uh, a book called Sleeping with the Dictionary. Then Tyrone Williams, two poems. One is called Cant, C-A-N-T, not C-A-N apostrophe T, although there's a pun there, and written by H. Self himself. And then finally, John Keane, a parallel text, prose poem experiment called Persons and Places. Um, so I want to tell you about Mod Poke Plus, and then I want to return to some of the poems I just listed to tell you a little bit about them. And then I'm going to once again encourage you to watch the next short video. It's optional, totally optional. You do not need to hear me go on about some of the ideas of the language poets, but um, it'll be there available to you. Um, Mod Po Plus in week eight is just a plethora of exciting language or language identified or language affiliated, that is language movement affiliated poets. Ray Armentrout, whom we met back in week two, is very much a first generation language poet, a San Francisco area poet, later LA, San Diego, much identified with the group that I just mentioned. Ron Silliman, absolutely. Uh, Mod Po people will be f familiar with Ron Silliman. Um, along with my life, uh, some of his work, his early work, does exactly what I just described my, my life as having done. Uh, Robert Grenier, uh, who's older than the first generation language poets, but, um, but really a kind of inspiration and an ally. Uh, Meme Bersenbrug, a, a absolutely devastatingly fabulous poet, who I'm glad to say is in Mod Po Plus. Larry Eigner, who uh, moved to San Francisco from Boston in the middle of the whole scene and got involved with the, those colleagues. Lydia Davis, who's of course a, a writer of short stories and microfictions, but some of her strategies and some of her stories do exactly what we're talking about in week eight. Bruce Andrews, Fred Waugh, oh boy, the Mod Pope Plus is just chock full. Let me uh, comment just for a minute or two on some of the pieces. I already commented on my life as a disjunctive, out of order, new sentence uh, arranged, new sentence constructed, autobiography. It's really exciting to encounter an autobiography that doesn't go in order. It goes in order but year by year, but not within the year. Bob Perlman's Chronic Meanings picks up a, a couple of really important sub-themes of the course, one of which, of course, is the experimental elegy. It is, in fact, a pre-elegy of a colleague and friend, Lee Hickman, an editor of Trembler, a Los Angeles-based supporter of and poet of the language group uh, who uh, got a diagnosis of HIV positive and um, chronic meaning is a pre-elegy, uh, really a, a poem written in honor. And you'll see when you get to that poem how Perlman uses the idea of experimental writing to say something about the cutting off of life during the AIDS crisis. Susan Howe, my Emily Dickinson. I'm really glad that that's here. Um, Susan Howe uh, is, is really trying to try, is, is trying to give us a sense in a long book length, close reading of a single poem by Emily Dickinson and a lot, much, and, and a lot more, um, trying to give us a sense of what it's like when a language poet looks back at Dickinson and finds in Dickinson all the things all the things in that proto-modernist that we encounter later in the course, and particularly in weeks eight, nine, and 10. So it's an updating of Dickinson. It's perfect for the course. I'm so glad that um, Susan Howe gives us a chance to circle back to Dickinson, to back to week one of this course. Um, Sleeping with the Dictionary is a fabulous book, and the two poems, the, the, the work that we pick from it is not sufficient to give you a sense. A full sense of the book, so I urge everybody to go immediately to your online or in-person bookstore and um, get a copy of Sleeping with the Dictionary. Uh, it, the book really does what the title suggests. 
Um, what, would hap what would happen if you decided to take the dictionary as your lover? Um, Tyrone Williams, uh, Kant, and written by H. Self, two poems that textually, word by word and phrasally, do what the language poets do, in my opinion, at their best, which is to torque idioms, to take them, to twist them, to recalibrate them so that, the, so that meaning, meaning exfoliates. So it produces multiple readings just as it, just as it goes along. And um, Tyrone Williams looks back using the tools of the language poets and uh, of course of other, many other experimental traditions in 20th century American poetry to try to look at uh, racial injustice and racism and anti-blackness and the history of, of that in the US while doing the work um, at the same time of uh, an experimental poet in the contemporary scene. And in doing so really extends the language poetry to where it ought to go. And John Keane, who has pro provided, as I say, parallel text prose poem. Um, so you have parallel uh, columns in which uh, W.E.B. Du, uh, e. du Bois and George Santayana um, kind of circle around each other in Harvard Yard at Harvard University in the late 19th century, but don't connect. So it's a perfect kind of way to end the chapter that begins with my life in a way, because what you have is these two lives that are moving along and should connect, but don't connect. And the poet has figured out how to give us both views, not just one, which is of course the traditional way is to pick a POV and stick with it. So that's week eight. Uh, very exciting, uh, an introduction really to the, to the emergent contemporary scene as it was understood in the 80s and 90s in particular. And we hope you enjoy it and I hope you'll find some time, it'll be tough, I realize if this is your first time through ModPo to look at ModPo Plus and to uh, encounter some of those other poets as well.